Hello, and welcome to another video lecture from Mr. Mosier's American History class. Uh, this is our series looking at the American Civil War, and today's topic will be talking about the soldiers, the weapons, uh, the medicine of the time period, and the role women will play in the American Civil War. The textbook readings for this particular series looks at pages 514 and 515, and pages 533 to 534. The guided questions that we'll be looking at is how did new weapons like the rifle and mini ball impact the war? What challenges did soldiers face? Why was disease such a problem for soldiers during the American Civil War? And what roles will women play during the American Civil War? So here we go. Let's talk about the soldiers, the women, and the medicine. The fighting of the American Civil War was very, very atrocious, huge numbers of casualties. And a lot of that stems from new improvements in the military technology of the time period, especially in the weapons of the period. A lot of technological improvements have been made on the rifles that were used, the cannons and artillery, all of which improved the accuracy of these weapons, meaning that you could fire them and hit your target, and the range, meaning that you could hit something a lot further away. The rifles that the soldiers were using, you see in the photograph over here to, to my right, you see, or to your left, uh, these rifles now had a range of about 600 yards. That's six football fields in length. I mean, that you could hit something, you know, 600 yards, six football fields away from you and, and be fairly accurate uh, through some training. These weapons, although they were more accurate and more lethal at a lot further range, the military tactics of the time period had not really caught up yet. Most of these soldiers fought like their grandfathers did in the American Revolutionary War. As you see in this photograph here, they generally lined up in long lines on open fields and fired at each other back and forth. Now, their tactics will change as the war progresses, and they'll start fighting more as we would think today, you know, behind trench in trenches, behind walls, behind fences. Uh, it's pretty insane to stand in line and shoot at each other across an open field. Um, but initially, these battles were fought that way. That was the tactics of the time period, and it resulted in very, very high casualties. What made these weapons so accurate and so lethal at a lot larger range? Well, there's really two reasons for that. The first one was the rifle. The rifles of the time period, as we see here from the Civil War reenactor, we had come and visit us here at, at Westside Middle School, um, causes the bullet, when it leaves the barrel, to actually spin, kind of like a quarterback throwing a nice tight spiral. There are grooves built into the rival, rifle that you see there uh, that causes that bullet to spin when it comes out. And as the bullet spins, it creates less resistance, air resistance, and it's able to fly straighter and faster. Also, the bullet used the time period was a bullet known as a mini ball, and you can see the photograph here of what it kind of looked like. It is the shape of like a football, and again, it, it gives it less air resistance, less drag as it's passing through the air, and it flies straighter and faster. Uh, so that mini ball combined with this rifling technique made these rifles that much more accurate. You can now fire a gun from about 600 yards away, six football fields in length, and be fairly accurate and hit your target. And so if you're lined up in a straight line and you just have to aim, you know, four to 600 yards away from somebody, you probably will be able to hit something pretty accurately if you've been well trained. Life for the soldiers was pretty challenging. Uh, men initially volunteered when the war first started. Uh, this idea of you know, being a man, her being very heroic, was very appealing to a lot of men. Um, but these were all volunteers. They had never served in the military before. Uh, and so they had to be actually trained on combat basics, like marching and shooting. Uh, how to fix, uh, fix these uh, large knives that you could put at the end of the rifle called bayonets and how to use your bayonet and be trained to be able to fire a rifle in, uh, in three shots under one minute of time. And that takes drill and discipline and practice, and that was something that these soldiers had to be done uh, upon entering in the military. Now, as we've mentioned before, neither side was really very well prepared when the war first broke out. Uh, they thought the war wasn't going to last very long, so they didn't have very large standing armies neither side, north or south, and so these volunteers had to get kind of broken into fighting. Soldiers will face shortages of things like food, clothing, and supplies. That'll be a bigger problem for the Confederates than it will be for the north, but both sides will have challenges with those, and we'll see that both sides begin choosing specific uniform colors. 
The Union side will wear generally the blue, as you see here in this, this blue soldier's cap, and in the photograph you see there, that'll become the color associated with the Northern armies, will be the color of blue. The Confederates will typically wear a grayish color, and as you can see here in this particular soldier's cap, a uh, gray cap, although because supplies were so short in the Confederacy, it was not too uncommon to find Confederate soldiers wearing whatever they could get their hands on. It could be blue uniforms, blue coats, um, it wasn't always necessarily uh, blue and gray, but generally the two armies will try to do those. This is a picture taken of some Civil War reenactors of some of the tents that some of the soldiers, especially in the north, lived under. You can see some of their mess kit supplies down below here in the photograph, their coat, uh, their um, satchel that keeps all their bullets and the mini balls and gunpowder that they would use to fight here. Um, this would be a two, three person tent or four person tent, depending on how many people you could kind of squeeze in there. Uh, this is another photograph taken of some Civil War reenactors. Those were the dipper cups. Uh, those were kind of like the all purpose utensil. You could use it to dip into a river or stream, the drink out of. Uh, you could put, um, make soup out of it and heat it over an open flame or make coffee uh, through there as well. Uh, some of the soldiers ate this very hard biscuit called a, a hard tack that was very difficult to eat. It was kind of like a floury bread biscuit that was very, very hard to eat. And so sometimes they would take it and they would dip it into their coffee to soften up the bread a little bit so it wasn't quite so difficult to basically eat. So soldiering was very difficult for the, for the men who fought during the Civil War. What about the medicine? What about the soldiers who were impacted, who were shot and wounded? What was their medical treatment like? Well, Interesting enough, most of the soldiers who died, and we numbers vary, but we think somewhere between 600 to 622,000 plus soldiers died during the Civil War. But what's astonishing is two-thirds of them died from disease. They didn't necessarily die from combat. So why was disease such a huge problem? Well, partly it was poor hygiene. People didn't know much about germs back then, so they didn't really wash their hands. Surgeons who were conducting operations didn't really wash their hands between surgeries. Soldiers would drink from filthy water sources. They would use latrines. They'd go to the bathroom right next to where they got their drinking water from. And again, they didn't realize that you know when you go to the bathroom, especially when you poop, uh, you have bacteria in there and that can get into the water source and that would really spread throughout the camps. Um, you also had all kinds of mosquitoes that carry diseases, bed bugs, lice, that would help spread these diseases as well. The number one killer of soldiers was actually dysentery, which is a type of diarrhea. It's really bad diarrhea. And diarrhea causes your body to dehydrate and lose water and it can be very lethal. It can cause some of your organs to start shutting down. So. Disease was rampant in most of these camps. Lice was a problem. Uh, it was just not the cleanliest of places that for soldiers to live. They're outside in the elements. The weather is a contributing factor there as well. And then if you did happen to be shot by a, by a mini ball, those mini balls were so destructive, it shattered bones that the only way to save the soldier would be to amputate. And you can see that in the photograph here of a surgeon uh, modeling how to perform basically a amputation. Gangrene is a bacteria that would be kind of formed in the wounds of these soldiers. And it creates a toxin uh, that starts killing the tissue and making it kind of turn green and then turn black as it basically kills all the cells. And so if a wounded soldier was wounded by a mini ball, and that wound got infected and festered, uh, that gangrene would spread throughout the body and eventually kill the soldier. So the best way to save these soldiers was oftentimes by just amputation, by just removing the, the wounded body part, the leg and the arm, which was probably the, the easier places and body parts to remove through these bone saws they would use to cut through the, cut through the, the wounded soldier. Um, the Northern Army, I uh, did have a plan to help treat all these medical soldiers, the wounded uh, the soldiers, and it did actually end up about three-fourths of soldiers will survive amputations by the, by the end of the war. So the, the medical field, although today we look at it as being very ghastly and, and, and very kind of primitive, at the time period it was kind of a developing field and proved to be very, very beneficial to the soldiers and saved a lot of soldiers' lives. What kind of role did women play in the Civil War? Well, as many men volunteered to go fight in the war, women had to take on more leadership roles back in the community, whether it was working in factories, textile factories, ammunition factories, or running the farms and businesses. And in some cases, as you see in the photograph here, some women joined their husbands on the battlefields and cooked and cleaned for the soldiers. Um, 
in their soldier camps. So um, they did whatever they possibly could do. A major role for women was serving that as nurses. Today, we kind of have the stereotype that you no know, nurses are women, although that's not necessarily true. It's a pretty common stereotype we have. What was interesting in the 1860s was that women were not seen as nurses. Very few women were actually nurses. This was generally was a male occupation. Um, but starting in the Civil War, many women began volunteering, oftentimes serving unpaid to work in these field hospitals. Um, there are many very brave women who will come to these battlefields and come to these army hospitals and see this very unsterile, dirty environment and will try to get these surgeons and hospitals to kind of clean up their act so it would help the soldiers benefit. And one of these women was a woman named Clara Barton. Clara Barton will volunteer throughout the Civil War. She insisted on clean bandages, kind words, kind treatment of soldiers once they came out of surgery. Um, she was very instrumental in this idea of triage where you treat different soldiers um, who are more severe sooner than the ones who are less injury, injured and severe. So she will play a very large role throughout the Civil War. And after the Civil War is over, she actually will end up founding the American Red Cross, which is still a very important institution for us for today. Women will also serve as messengers. Uh, as messengers. Uh, some will also serve as spies. They'll spy on the opposing enemy uh, and then give those secrets to their side. Uh, the most famous spy was Rose O'Neill Greenhow, who a spy for the Confederacy. She lived in Washington, D.C., and she would go to the, many of these parties and listen to generals and soldiers kind of brag about what they were doing. She would take very detailed mental notes, and then she would write those mental notes down, and then she would smuggle those messages into the Confederacy. Some, spy, uh, some Northerners will also, women will serve as guides. Harriet Tubman, the famed uh, conductor of the Underground Railroad, who knew the areas of Virginia and Maryland very, very well was used by a lot of the soldiers and, and, and military leaders to help them find their ways throughout the South. And yes, some women will actually fight in the American Civil War. However, they will not fight openly. Uh, today, men, men and women serve in the U.S. military and the U.S. Armed for Forces, but in 1860, women were not allowed to fight. So some women will actually disguise themselves as men and play this role as a man and fight in the Civil War. They'll cut their hair, and unless they were discovered, they would fight alongside their male you know, counterparts in the American Civil War. So in this particular lecture series, we've kind of looked at the soldier, uh, some of their hardships and challenges that they face. We looked at some of the new weapons that really bring about more death and destruction in the American Civil War, and some of the various ways that women will play a role in the American Civil War. As always, if you have questions, please come see your teacher, but thank you for listening.